And we are live on the Freedom Media Network. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today, we answer the question. It's a question I often get as a former Illinois resident. What's the matter with Illinois when we return in a moment? Okay, so our guest today is Dan Proft, host of the nationally syndicated radio show, The Dan Prof Show on the Salem Radio Network and the local morning drive time show, Chicago's Morning Answer, on AM560 in Chicago. Dan is an entrepreneur, editorial contributor to the Chicago Tribune, and former Republican candidate for governor. Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Kurt. Thank you. And I should I should also note we are we are we both share the April 29th is a birthday and uh, are alums of the illustrious Bennett Academy. That's right, and I'm uh, several years your senior, although you couldn't tell it from our respective visages. Yes, yes. I don't know if you saw, but I actually shaved it off about two months ago. Wow. Yeah, and so it's, it grows back nicely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So. Last month, I think it was last month, it might have been a month month or two ago, in the wake of the COVID-19 mess, Don Harmon, who's the Illinois Senate president, wrote Congress and requested, I believe it was a, uh, was it, uh, it was a $41 billion bailout. Right. Which means that Illinois' fiscal issues would become America's fiscal issues. Um the state's pension debt stands at Moody says it's 240 billion. Uh, I've seen a number of different numbers. So, what's the matter with Illinois when it comes to when it comes to? Well, let's talk about everything systemic. Um, one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, why do they keep voting the same people in if they know it's so screwed? Why do they keep voting the same people in? Well, I mean, you've had a couple of things happen, right? Number one, about 50 years ago, they figured out that the way to really get your hooks into someone is not just to give them a job. It's not just to make an appeal through uh, some kind of program you would enact if you were elected. It's to get them a job with a guaranteed pension on the back end so you have them for life. The pension is the payoff. Uh, but you have to go through the system for 20 years or 25 years. And over that period of time, the 50 years that once they figure this out, what did they start to do? They started to eliminate that trade off that used to be in place for job security and pe uh, pension and health care benefits. I'm going to accept a little bit a lower salary to work in the public sector. Over time, that changed to where now you have the best of both worlds. If you're a public sector employee, you make 15 to 20 percent more than your private sector counterparts. Plus, you still have that guaranteed pension and health care benefit. And so it became very attractive and that made it very unattractive to go against the powers that be. And you uh, amass an army over time to the point now where more than 10 percent of Illinois are current state and or, or local government workers or retirees. So that is a huge voting block. So you you know you combine that huge voting block with uh, some uh, champagne socialists uh, in particular well-heeled communities or regions and other beneficiaries of transfer payments of the state's welfare programs uh, that are also effectively dependents, the same way I would call the pensioners effectively dependents. And all of a sudden you have a governing coalition that's very difficult to pierce. And the second problem was the Republican Party in this state, rather than zig when the rest of the country zigged uh, during the Reagan revolution or during the Gingrich revolution, we were big government Republicans when they, we had Republican governors and even Republican control of the state Senate and then even the two year interregnum where we had control of the House of the only two years of the last 40. And so uh, ultimately, we became junior partners to the Democrat power structure, where we agreed that governance is just about distributing the spoils of war, and uh, we're going to play ball uh, and try to be part of the group at the table, carving it up and distributing those spoils. And ultimately, a couple of corruption scandals 
and inept leadership, just in terms of straight competence as compared to the Democrats in terms of uh, real politic, and you have a recipe for one party rule and then one party run of the table with Chicago as your backstop. And, you know, that that's sort of the, the Reader's Digest version of how this has become the worst governed state, I would argue, by the numbers in American history. What is the end game here? I mean, is it I, I've heard, you know, they're hoping it just they pull a Detroit. Right. So the politicians can raise their hands up, give it to a judge and say, sorry, we did what we could. Is that their end game? Is that even possible? I mean, two hundred and forty billion dollars in debt. I mean, how do you even deal with yeah, that? Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't. You don't pay it off. I mean, there's I don't think there's any intention. I don't think there's any belief that that will ultimately be paid off. But you don't know what it is. It's all political expediency because that's what you do in a kleptocracy. This is about getting mine and getting out. So I don't know how it uh, plays out, Kurt. That sounds like somebody else's. Just want to make it through the election cycle. I want to make it through the next five years until I retire. I want to make sure it's there for me. And when ultimately uh, the contradictions become overwhelming, then the whole thing will collapse. And who knows on whose watch that'll be and who knows who will pay the price. I mean, I, I compare it very much to the Soviet Union under Gorbachev. I mean, the, he didn't uh, advance perestroika or glasnost because he wanted the Soviet Union to reform. He thought he needed to to continue its existence. And of course, the internal contradictions came to a head and the and the Soviet Union collapsed in on itself. That's sort of the same thing I expect will happen to Illinois. And maybe one of the bellwethers will be one of the pension funds failing. I don't think it will be real for people until one of the pension funds fails. And the Chicago Police Pension Fund is uh, first in line by the numbers right now. So maybe if that failed, if that couldn't pay out current beneficiaries, that would spark some kind of real adult thinking about system change. But until then, I think it's just, uh, you know, let's just make it through one more primary, one more general election, one more contract, and continue distributing the spoils of war as long as we can. And the you, you made the case, I mean, it might have been 10 years ago when you were running for governor, but I remember you giving a speech about Illinois when they want for more more money, when they ask for more money, they say it's about the kids. It's about protecting the least among us. But I, I remember you giving a talk that said well, Illinois was actually ranked 52nd in terms of taking care of people with developmental disabilities. Like we were behind Puerto Rico. Or Illinois is behind 50, Puerto Rico. 50, yeah, 51st behind uh, the District of Columbia. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So where's all the money going? I mean, is it going just into these pension funds and other contracts and... Yeah. I mean, what before the pandemic, one in four dollars at the state level were going to uh, the state pension funds uh, with uh, the hammering that uh, everybody's budget has taken during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Uh, projections are now that it may be upwards of one of every two dollars the state spends will go to pay uh, pension obligations. And um I mean, so that's, you know, to the exclusion of Medicaid and K through 12 education and everything else the state spends money on. This is where you start to, um, you know, um, it, 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 you start to hit marrow and that that's what's happening. So um, what does that mean in terms of the wrecking? I don't know, because with, you know, you, there hasn't been a formal bailout, as Don Harmon asked, but with the Fed setting up this these uh, municipal facility lending instruments, uh, Illinois just borrowed $1.2 billion. Now that's chump change compared to the obligations as you were describing, but it just buys a little bit more time. It gives me a few more months. It gives me uh, a little bit more money to, to move around to try to prop up the house of cards. And so what you may see for terribly run states, big blue states and with big blue cities like Chicago and Illinois, like New York, like Connecticut, Kentucky, California, those with huge unfunded pension liabilities that are uh, you know, that, that are that are striking marrow now, you may see them backdoor bailed out through borrowing that the Fed set up with the liquidity it's been given versus a formal uh, check or a grant from the fiscal side of the House from Congress. What's been the situation in terms of businesses fleeing, certainly not coming in, at, at, at certainly compared to the rest of the Midwest? Yeah, I mean, Illinois is, I believe, uh, Ohio may still, but I think 
I think Illinois is the only state in the Midwest that has more government employees than manufacturing employees. Really? Uh, and that's that's a, pr- a pretty big statement for the, the transportation hub of the Midwest that uh, really uh, has a reputation, not just historically as a meatpacking city, but as a manufacturing mecca because of the airport and everything around Chicago and O'Hare, as you well know. So, um, yeah, I mean, the hemorrhaging continues uh, it's only increasing in pace. Uh, people with capacity that are leaving, businesses that are relocating. It's hard to measure in real time businesses leaving, and it's certainly hard to measure the opportunity costs we're paying of the businesses that are here that are not expanding, or the businesses that are here that are investing elsewhere when they could expand here, or the businesses that aren't coming here that are not considering Illinois for either location or expand or or uh, investment. Um, but, um, but, uh, but, but we know just in terms of the outmigration of residents over the last decade, where we've led the nation for the last six years straight, you're talking about upwards of uh, 30, $35 billion in annual GDP that's left Illinois over the last decade. I mean, we're one of the states that expects to lose at least one, perhaps two congressmen uh, after the 2020 census. So that tells you everything you need to know about the outmigration right there. The um, uh, I, about probably ten years ago, I was a member of the Union League Club downtown in Chicago, and I picked up a, a book. It was a biography of William Hale Thompson, who was mayor in what the twenties, late late teens, twenties, and it was yeah. amazing reading that that the game was exactly the same back then. Now he he was yeah, Big Bill, Big Bill Thompson was Al Capone's front guy. I mean, so that the last Republican mayor of Chicago nearly 100 years ago was just a flack for Al Capone. So, I mean, it's not exactly a tradition of good government we can hearken back to, uh, <laughs> right. you know, and, and, and pull forward. Yeah, I mean, Chicago has um, uh, there's a great book about Chicago, if you want to understand Chicago and its history, called The Outfit by Gus Russo that I'd recommend. But um, what you're talking about uh, is 100 years of of kleptocracy. Uh, at least, but just starting at the point that you started at. And what happened is it radiated out from Chicago to become the political culture and the political culture statewide in the suburbs, in the exurbs, central Illinois, southern Illinois. And people really underestimate how difficult it is to change political culture. It's not just winning one election or winning one office, even the governor's race or a Senate race. It's it's really... Uh, telling people and uh, getting buy-in from enough people to change how politics is done in Illinois. I'll give you just a quick anecdote. A guy that I was talking to uh, a little while ago who uh, is a sales rep for a bunch of manufacturing conglomerate. He's got about an 18 state territory. And he said, the the thing about, and he's not from Illinois. So the thing about Illinois that's so wild is you guys here talk about politics more than all of my other states combined. When I have casual conversations, I go out to dinner with clients. Politics is the topic more so than all of my other states combined. And I thought, oh, that's that's really interesting because what does it tell you? It tells you that government is more central in Illinois than it is everywhere, anywhere else. Everything here runs through the government at the city level, at the state level, even at the, at the, the suburban and exurban and down state level. This is so government centric, and that's really the problem. So, and that's just how you institutionalize kleptocracy. So, how do you change that culture? It's a, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to get people to say we have to radically rethink how uh, government is set up in this state. We've got too much of it. We've got too many elected officials. It's too expensive. But nobody's having that conversation right now. It's amazing how uh, people. Many times on the left, we'll talk about the power of corporations and the political power of corporations running the country. But if you really look at it, if that was true, then New York and Illinois might be bastions of economic growth, right? I mean, when when you look at the the corporations that are there, uh, now that's on the surface. Illinois has had a history of pretty legendary brands, State Farm, Caterpillar, uh, Standard Oil. You know, you have um, uh, Aon Sears. is there now. I mean, on, and on. Yeah. on and on. Are, are they 
simply powerless and controlled and just support the status quo or does it not is it not ill suited to them is the situation not ill suited to them i mean it can't it can't be wonderful them with with property taxes and the like um for their employees and 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 for them um or are they just completely powerless they're not powerless. I think that so many of them have thrown in and sort of accepted the paradigm. You know, the, that's the Chicago way. That's how it works. You know, it's about about uh, uh, peddling influence. It's about um, and, and the bigger brands that you're talking about, you know, they can weather the storms, whatever they are. But, you know, Caterpillar's here, but I mean, it's making all its investments in other states to the extent it's making domestic investments. So what does that tell you? The same thing with ADM, which was a, a, a you know, was a company that was originally based in Decatur. Um, they, they're just, they're, they're not seeing Illinois as their future. So they're slowly divesting from it. It doesn't happen overnight, especially when you're that big, but it's happening. And I think they see, um, um, I think they they have been complicit. I think they have been cowardly. I don't think they've done the heavy lifting they could to change the political paradigm here. They could have been more aggressive in recruiting. For example, when the Chicago mayor's office was an open seat in, in 2019, last year's election, they could have done a better job recruiting a non, you know, uh, scion of a political uh, dynasty like uh, Bill Daly or, and, and a non-socialist like the rest of the field, um, somebody that was competent and would reform minded and, you know, somewhat impeachable, uh, unimpeachable, which is a, a difficult thing to find here. But you could have had a real effort to find people. Uh, and there just hasn't been that effort. And because you have no organized opposition party, they sort of default to the, well, it's not my job. I'm running my business. These are the choices we have. So I'm going to make a, uh, you know, Machiavellian least worst choice every time rather than trying to do the heavy lifting to, uh, to change the, the paradigm and to, and to reorder the system. I just, even if I wanted to do that, I don't know exactly how I would do that. There's been a couple guys who've stepped up big, as you know, over the years, but it just hasn't been enough. And um, and now there's a belief that it's just Illinois is unsalvageable. It's just gone. It's like California or New York. I mean, it's just gone yeah. for the foreseeable future until there's some sort of um, force majeure event, like a pension fund failing, or there's a Deus ex machina event, something you know that rescues us from ourselves magically. But that's not much of a strategy. Um, you brought up New York. And California, you know, the trifecta, Illinois, California, New York of prime lockdown states yeah. it, during COVID. New Jersey, yeah. New Jersey. Yeah. 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 I have a friend in New Jersey and, it, it, you know, New Jersey's bad when he had to go to New York just to get a haircut and eat in a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, what what is the the common denominator? Because you look at the numbers. And the states that lock down most seem to have it worst. Um, you know, down here, as you know, I have a lot of family. My mom's up in Illinois, a lot of family up there. And the, the, the information they're getting from the media is just, they, it's like, it's like nothing exists outside of the bubble. And our kids are back at camp. Uh, we're, we're going out to restaurants. We're going out and about, I think we've, we have a, a huge medical center here, medical university of South Carolina. They mm -hmm. furloughed, I don't know, thousands of workers said, stay away. And I think uh, a friend of ours who's a doctor there said they have, who, by the way, is a transplant doctor who mo got moved to somewhere else because they weren't doing transplants. So uh, who knows how many people didn't get transplants during this. But uh, four active right. cases at a huge medical center. What's what's the common denominator between, you know, uh, I mean, there are three Democratic governors. Um, is there a common denominator about why they have locked down so much and so hard amidst this COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, amidst other uh, compared to other states? I mean, these are um, these are closed systems. Uh, and Chicago is the most closed of the closed systems. And by that, I mean, um, 
uh, I mean, yeah, you understand sort of academically closed system versus open system, but Chicago is more right. closed in LA than San Francisco, than New York City, in the sense that, uh, as, as a famous saying here, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. You know, in other places where you try to do business or you interact with people, it's, um, it's oh, well, um, you know, I'm in the same space. Uh, you know, uh, this is my friend, Kurt, uh, Joe, let me introduce you to Kurt, so forth. In Chicago, it's uh, we're in the same space. That's my friend, Kurt. You don't talk to Kurt, Joe, until I tell you <laughs> to talk to Kurt. That's it. Really, that's how it is. And other people have observed this, too, and, and including people in the venture capital space where it really presents itself. It's really a, an interesting sort of uh, subtextual pathology that exists here as part of the political culture. But what you have is government centric big cities and states where there is nothing but political political gain to be had by Mayor Garcetti in L.A., by de Blasio in New York, by Lightfoot in Chicago, and then the three Democrat socialist governors over the top, by instilling fear, uh, coming in with a solution, uh, the men of science and women of data that come together to provide the solution, and you just do what I say because all things run through the government, city and state, and I will shepherd you to safety. So, and then as you were just mentioning too, the media, you have a captive media that serves as basically the propaganda arm of the political class. They are a big government media core. And so, yes, this is a government thing. Uh, and this is where the government shines and you listen to the government and the government knows best and we are your betters. And a lot of people accept that and they, they create frenzy, they instill fear, and they reap the political benefits of a fearful people who cling to their leaders in a time of crisis that they've largely exaggerated. And uh, that's exactly what's happened. We've seen it in the, the polling of approval ratings for both Lightfoot and Pritzker in the city of Chicago before the unrest uh, in response to the George Floyd killing. Uh, both Pritzker and Lightfoot had uh, nearly 80% approval ratings in the city of Chicago. And Pritzker statewide was over 60%. So fear, reap the political benefit, continue to create fear, continue to reap the political benefit. Now there's danger in that because it can turn on you in a hurry. At some point, the truth gets out to enough people and maybe you're left holding the bag, but that hasn't been the case so far. So Mike Madigan is the Speaker of the House, controls the Democratic Party. Uh, how long has he been in power? 45 years? 50 years? Uh, yeah, longest serving State House Speaker in American history. And he's been uh, in office for 50 years. And you had, so for years, you know, growing up uh, around Chicago, you had uh, Mayor Daley, the, the, the second, <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better term. Um yeah. Now you have Lightfoot, you know, then you had Rom, right? And, and and now you have Lightfoot, you have Pritzker, who's an, a newbie. Um, is Madigan, is Madigan the de facto controller of everything that goes on um, or, or not so much anymore? He's starting to fade. I mean, he's still a powerful influence, but he hasn't been prominent during the last, during 2020 since, right. uh, certainly since the pandemic. And maybe that's in part because, uh, you know, he's almost 80 years old and he's in the vulnerable population. I don't know. But um, so he's still a, a, a shadowy a figure and a powerful figure. But, you know, what you see is uh, like in Chicago with a light foot who's really tried to assert herself by saying some just, I mean, unbelievable things, remarkable things, remarkably authoritarian things, things that you would expect to come out of the mouth of Rod Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, uh, not uh, not a mayor here in any city in this in this uh, country. But but they're really um, feeling their oats, and I think it's um, part of that uh, younger uh, AOC and the Squad type of cultural Marxist that feels like they are the, at the tip of the spear in terms of where the movement is, where movement politics is in urban centers. And uh, they're ready to discard uh, their elders. Uh, so 
I don't think necessarily, you know, and you saw, as you mentioned at the outset, Don Harmon, the Senate president, he's a new Senate president, John Cullerton, who was a Madigan ally and, and their godfathers of each other's kids for all the same 50 years. He just retired at the end of last year. So you, you see a changing of the guard and it's getting and the ironic thing is oh, everybody and Republicans, especially who don't want to do the heavy lifting. When Madigan's gone, we just need to get Madigan, right? Well, it turns out when Madigan goes, when Cullerton goes, things actually get worse because you go from transactional machine politicians to avowed Marxists. And that's what we have in Don Harmon as the Senate president. And that's what we'll have, I bet, when uh, uh, it's time for Madigan to move on one way or the other. And that's what you see in the city of Chicago. This is where uh, Lightfoot is. These champagne socialists, these identitarians, uh, in a way that Madigan and Cullerton, these old guard Democrats, or not. I mean, th there's a real culture change, even though they're still operating under the same, under an umbrella with the same label on it. Obviously, the issue of race has been in the uh, the news uh, for the, to, to say the least uh, over the over the last several weeks. Um, you know, to to a point that probably many in the country have never seen before. Um, you know, growing up in the 90s, there was the Rodney King, the L.A. riots, but that was out in L.A. And if you weren't in L.A., you watched it on TV. But even here, like here in Charleston, small city riots, you know, Fargo. I saw in Fargo, North Dakota, there were riots. You see a lot of folks. Um, uh, who's the uh, senator in, uh, in Oregon? I can't remember who it was, said this shows the importance of getting out and voting. When you look at. Not all. Well, I would say probably most of the big cities that have had issues of police brutality or have issues of systemic racism, especially in the schools. Um, I, my response to that is, who do you want them to vote for? Like in Minneapolis, do you want them then to vote right. Republican? Uh, in Chicago, do you want them to vote Republican? I mean, um, so what? What right. when you when you brought up, you know, um, I guess one one thing in Chicago that I'd like to hear your your opinion on or or, or educate us all on is for years, you know, the Democrats are the kings of and queens of racial harmony, and for years though you would see white Democrat politicians in Chicago use Hispanic and black Demo Democratic politicians as pawns, would they not, to, to kind of divide and conquer? Um, yeah. and, and now all of a sudden they're, they're, they're lecturing all of us about changing our votes. Um, what, where are we at right now? What, what kind of changes do you see need to be made in a city like Chicago, uh, racially? Um, I know you've worked on school choice for a while, um, you know, and and you've been as we if you work in politics. Well, we both worked for for Tony Parika, who liked to campaign in areas where he's never going to get votes. So, you know, the south side of Chicago, west side of Chicago. I mean, they're these are different worlds and extremely well, they segregated. They are. I mean, yeah, de, de facto segregation. Chicago is is one of, if not the most de facto segregated city in America, big city in America. It's very sad. And it's a failure. It's a failure of the civilian political power structure over the last hundred years or certainly since Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. I mean, it's been going on for generation after generation. So this is why I'm so um amused, uh, even though these aren't amusing times, by the systemic racism charge, to your point, or I think you were going, oh, systemic racism. So, okay, so these, these systems are institutionally racist. Got it. So who's in charge of the systems? I mean, who's in charge of who's in charge of K through 12 education? Who is in charge of academia? Who is in charge of uh, all of the arts and entertainment sectors in America? And that's certainly true in Chicago, New York and L.A. Who's who is really in charge of corporate America? I mean, who really uh, are occupy those C-suites? Bunch of conservative free market types. No, of course not. And then in governor's mansions and particularly mayoralties uh in in big cities around the country i mean you guys are in charge it is 
And the response I got in this one conversation was, yes, but that's a lot of, there's a lot of white men, white people, and particularly white men. I know, right. White men, white women, black men, black women, Latino men, Latino women. You know what they have in common? Not their race, their mentality. They are, they're all singing from the same identitarian uh, hymnal. That's the problem. The problem is you have uh, systemic racism. You say, and you've been in charge, of particularly of big cities, for half a century. I mean, I think the biggest city in America with a Republican mayor is San Diego. So, so tell me why uh, the Chicago public school system is one of the worst in the Western Hemisphere. Tell me why the Wall Street Journal still today, last week, called Chicago Murder USA. Why on May 31st, we had the most violent day in the city of Chicago in 60 years. That's because conservative Republicans are in charge. So you want to, you, you, the, these phrases, these tropes that are thrown out, systemic racism, this, and oh, and there's no accountability. They, they, they're great at playing the innocent bystander game. So to you, the, 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 the point you made before about you know, it shows the importance of getting out and vote. Who are they talking about? Of course, they're talking about Trump. If you would have got out and voted, uh, we, we didn't have Trump. We wouldn't have these problems. Everything is Trump. Everything is scapegoating. Everything's the police's fault, but it's not the civilian political authority's fault. Everything is uh, slavery's fault, but it's nothing that's happened in the interceding 170 years. There's no assessment of the $30 trillion we spent on the great society. There's no assessment of anything anybody's done if you're a good idea, if you're an identitarian in good standing, who actually are in charge, who have the power to do whatever they want with these systems that are systemically racist. It is the most frustrating thing, but people have uh, chosen identitarian politics as a religion, really as a cult, and it's a death cult. And that's what you're seeing play out. For the last 50 years, what uh, what radicals figured out in the 60s was we can guilt white people into giving us what we demand uh, and we make claims for power based on our identity. So I'm making this claim for power based on the fact that I'm black. And if you don't accede to my claim, then you're racist and I'm entitled to burn it all down. And then other groups, uh, people that formed into groups that wanted to make the same claims on the same basis did it. And then so you have this solidarity marginality. My, my claim to power is that I'm black. My claim to power is that I'm gay. My claim to power is that I'm trans. My claim to power is that I'm Latinx. And that intersectionality, my claim to power is I have one or two or three of those characteristics. It is all based on identity. It is not based on behavior. It is not based on accomplishment. And uh, this is where we're at. And this is how you have a society commit cultural suicide, which is what we're doing. So looking out over the next several months um, is, well, it, and by the way, one thing I wanted to add, there's a great book. I don't know if you've read it. Amity Schley's uh, The Great Society. It's her newest book. Yeah. An excellent book. Yeah. And a lot of what we're seeing now is explained in that book starting in the right. 50s. Well, I think she started, she might even start in the 40s, 40s, 50s, 60s um, with uh, Sergeant Shriver and, and funding these programs and um, and the war on poverty, you know, was poverty was actually on a decrease and still until they declared war on it. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the, the, the black family was largely intact, 80 percent intact versus 75 percent illegitimacy rate today. And by the way, it's not limited to the black family. It's just most exact, most most prevalent there. But you have the same problems across societies. We become more secularized and decide that pol and decide that politics as our religion and government as our God. That, that's that that is a cultural problem that has just damaged black families the most, but it's damaging all of us. So looking out over the next few uh, few months, what, what what's going to happen in Illinois? Um, are they going to lock down again? Is he going to open up? I mean, you're opening up a little bit, right? Yeah, actually, um, I would say Lightfoot is more draconian or deuterian uh, than uh, Pritzker has been. I mean, she is, we're only opening the lakefront, you know, the outside, outside is closed in Chicago still to, to some extent. We're only opening the lakefront um, uh, June 22nd. Oh, wow. um, 
you, you, you don't have, I mean, you don't have indoor seating in restaurants. You don't have any cultural venues open. You have the, the playpen, this area of the lake that you know is closed for the summer, according to her. Um, uh, you have, uh, you, you have a posture that they've both taken, but she's taken more aggressively that basically don't look for gatherings of more than 50 people until there's a vaccine, um, which is just an impossible position to maintain, but it doesn't stop her from taking it. So, and, and I, I would be stunned if there is a, a school resumes in the fall in a way where kids are actually in school versus some sort of distance learning or some sort of hybrid. I mean, it is a catastrophe here. And when you, the next time you come back to Chicago, I will tell you, Kurt, I don't think you're going to recognize it after this all shakes out, after the economic devastation that self-inflicted shakes out in some of the great tourist areas of Chicago. I don't think you're going to recognize it because I think the, um, the, 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 the carnage, we're just starting to feel um, how, how bad it is, how many people's uh, livelihoods uh, have forever changed. I mean, we we've opened up, we opened up a month ago, and you still see this uh, slow churn of, of businesses just saying, "Sorry, I'm done. We're going. We're leaving." Yeah. And, and part of that was actually the riots too, because then we had curfews on top of that. And they said, "Sorry, we're just, we we've lost so much money." Um, but in Illinois, if if you're not opening up these restaurants or Chicago till late June, July. I mean, is it just going to be complete? Is it going to be like the Thanos snap or worse for small businesses and retail and restaurants in, in the city? I mean, I, I, you're seeing it. You're seeing, I mean, I, you're seeing a lot of uh, well-established restaurants that are saying we're, we're gone or it's, we're not coming back. I mean, you're hearing like some rumblings from really some iconic restaurants in Chicago that you wouldn't think would go down that they're teetering and restaurant groups that are teetering. You, you would know them well if I mentioned them. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and by the way, what is the attraction to live in a big city? If, if I mean, you're giving me nothing. Now, in addition to all the things that I, I endure in order to enjoy the restaurant scene, the nightlife, the cultural offerings, you're saying a, a lot of that's gonna be gone permanently. And the other stuff I can't access uh, in, in, until there's a vaccine, however long that takes, if it ever comes, um, why am I here? So I, I think, the I, again, the exodus, not just from Chicago and not just from Illinois, but from big urban centers will, uh, will really increase. Uh, and I think the more uh, the cities that were the most draconian are going to drive people out the fastest. And the whole notion that I didn't Pritzker say something too. We we're not going to have Lollapalooza or something like that until there's a vaccine. Yeah, I mean, Lollapalooza is gone. I mean, that's that's Lollapalooza is a half a million, a half a billion dollars in economic activity. They canceled the uh, one of these tech trade shows at McCormick Place. That show alone is one point five billion dollars in economic activity. You're going to have no revenue. You've got no shows. You're destroying uh, the tourism. Uh, industry in this state, which is a huge industry, uh, and uh, and 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 then what they say, you know, we'll just uh, graduate the state income tax and ask for a federal bailout, and even if you got all that money, and you're not going to get nearly what you need, and you're not going to get it fast enough, but even if you got it all, you just you're gonna have, you've make you're making this place uninhabitable, un, uh, or at least undesirable and uh, undesirable for people that have options, even options just in contiguous states, much less in states that are really growing, like South Carolina, like Florida, like Texas, like Tennessee, like the Southwest. Yeah, Scott McPherson, by the way, just commented on Facebook, Mercadante and McPherson were way ahead of the curve. <laughs> no question, no question. I, I so, actually, I, you know, it's funny. I wish uh, a, a buddy of mine that I went to Northwestern with uh, 25 years ago, I graduated. Said, you know, Arizona is still like the the, the 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 open west. It's still the frontier. You should just move out there and chart your life in Arizona. Oh my God, talk about uh, zigging when you should have zagged. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, opportunities in congruent states, um, your governor has found some in Wisconsin, right? And 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 your well, maybe your reporting or your uh, your co-hosts reporting uh, didn't didn't fly too well with the governor. 
Oh, yeah. Um, she got uh, my co-host on the morning show I do in Chicago, got Jim Acosta by the governor. She got her uh, press pass to his uh, briefings pulled because she, she was the one person in the Chicago press corps actually asking pointed questions. And frankly, it was nothing like Acosta and Trump because, you know, in the pandemic era, it's a pool reporter just reading questions. So it doesn't have any of the melodrama of a White House press briefing. And yet even that was too much for them to bear. So they banished her until she filed suit. And actually just recently, just yesterday, it was announced that they had capitulated and they would allow her back in. But I mean, it just shows you sort of the, the imperiousness of the political class. I think generally, and Illinois is perhaps the mo one of the most extreme examples of it. Um, you know, that when, when you don't hold people uh, to account, they won't feel like they need to be accountable. <laughs> and so that's, that's sort of the dynamic you have here, I, I, you know, and, and, and add e even a, a, as sort of a dopey politician as Pritzker is, add a $3 billion checkbook to that dynamic and you're really in a pretty strong position, which he is. And there, there, there's a lot of people who, it, it's funny when you, it's not funny, it's actually sad, but when you talk to them, I mean, I have relatives, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's just, when you're there and you talk to them, it's, it's depressing. Oh, there's nothing going on here, whatever. If you right. ever suggest that there's another state better than Illinois, those same people will all of a sudden turn and say, no, what do you, you know, when we move, when we move down here, it's like, oh, we South were Carolina. Yeah. Swamps. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my wife was pregnant at the time. It's like, oh yeah. How are, how are, you know, well, she's going to squat in a swamp and just plop yeah. the baby out of the swamp. Do, um, do they have hospitals in South Carolina? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we just, uh, <laughs> we have voodoo doctors. Um, but, you know, people warned, us, oh, well, they don't tax you enough. So your garbage services, your pickup, your parks, right. everything. The interesting piece right. is, and th th this, this encapsulates, I've told this story, uh, encapsulates Illinois. So uh, my in-laws live uh, in out near LaSalle, Peru, near Starved Rock, which is a pretty cool state park. And so the state parks are funded out of like the general fund, right? And so they were running low on money. And so they didn't have enough money for like upkeep of the park. So their solution was, we're just going to stop running ads. So less people come to the park. And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't understand. I don't understand that. And the interesting thing is here, our parks here are like, I think they said state and county parks are 80 or 90% self-sustaining because you pay a hundred dollars for a yearly pass. They have events, they do fundraise, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, we have the best garbage pickup. Imagine that we have lower taxes and better services. And so it's that yeah, bubble that people really think it's not possible. Shocking. Right. I mean, and, and yeah, I, I, it's funny you say that too, because as you, you're talking about Illinois, Illinois uh, is the, uh, state, the, the, the number one state in the nation in terms of the percentage of residents who want to leave. 50% <laughs> of residents want to leave. And the next closest is like Connecticut under 30%. Half the state wants to leave. They cite taxes, number one. And yet, what are we going to, you, you get that same mentality. I mean, it really, it's sort of, it, uh, Eric Hoffer, who is this, um, longshoreman turned philosopher who wrote the theory of, of mass movements. Um, he basically said, uh, here's the two conditions that are necessary for revolt or paradigm shift, which is people need to believe they're in charge of their own destiny and they need to believe that things could change. And, um, and I think that's what's missing in Illinois. People don't really believe they're in charge of their own destiny. They don't really think things can change. And so out of fear, they sort of accept a status quo that they see as inexorable. And then they, you know, rationalize it to themselves in conversations like you were describing. So they don't come across as like, you know, completely feckless or completely pathetic or completely stupid to uh, to indulge all of this. I think that's just the way they you know, make it make sense to stay here because they have to be here for job or family or for whatever other reason. So uh, New, New Jersey, you know, elected Chris Christie, Democrat state elects Chris Christie. 
maybe it's for his first term. I don't know how much his second term. He obviously got into some issues there. <laughs> uh, made some headway on some issues. Got some things passed. Had a high approval rating for a while, at least. Um, so Pritzker just got elected last year after a four-year run of something that maybe people thought wouldn't happen for, for a while, but uh, Republican Governor Bruce Rauner. Um, over that time, uh, did the governor make any headway toward anything regarding pensions, um, change, no. reform, anything? No, the only thing was a tax credit scholarship program, $500 million over five years, uh, it'd be able to raise hundred million dollars a year, private money to provide opportunity scholarships to kids. Uh, largely lower income, disproportionately minority, to go to better schools around the state. That's uh, the only uh, improvement that occurred during the Rauner administration that that persists. Um, but otherwise, now everything else actually arguably worsened. And and there was a a very weak, watered down version of pension reform that passed, which wouldn't really have done anything. But even that was struck down by the court, right? Uh, yeah, the court has uh, the state supreme court has struck down a couple of pension reform uh, efforts. Um, uh, so right, and and again, the state supreme court, for those who don't know, that's also an elected body here, ten year terms, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, controlled by the Democrats. So uh, you got a real problem. You got you got a real structural problem, and you've got an electorate that seems to want to continue speeding towards the the precipice um so it probably ends badly all right so so let's let's finish off by talking about your show where can so everyone in chicago knows where they can find you am 560 where can people around the country find you so uh the danpropshow.com is a site where you get podcasts and all that stuff and um uh, you can also check the affiliate listing. Uh, so we, I, I'm syndicated through the Salem radio network. So I'm on Salem stations, mostly Salem stations around the country in about 50 markets. And um, uh, that's the place, uh, danproftshow.com. And you can follow me at danproft or at danproftshow on social media. And uh, that's the way to stay in touch or get in touch and stay in touch and listen to the show. Cool. Well, Dan, cool. it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us from your bunker. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I do feel a little bit like Snake Pilsen escaped from Chicago, but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not quite that bad yet. But yeah, I, I, South Carolina, Charleston area, it's very attractive. Probably right second on my hit list behind uh, Naples, but uh, I like it. I'm, yeah, Italy, I'm Italy or Florida? <laughs> well, Florida first. Oh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how, how bad things get, but Florida first. But no, I, I appreciate it. It was great talking to you. It was good catching up. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, everyone, check out Dan on his website. Check out his show. If you're in Chicago, you should already be listening to it. Dan Prof, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kurt.